All right, can everyone in the room hear me? It is 10.30. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. <sighs> Love all of that. Welcome so much to, uh, for joining us today. This, is, this session is called ArcGIS Online Web Mapping with Arcade Expressions. My name is Lisa Berry. I'm a senior GIS engineer on the Living Atlas team, uh, but I am a big user and proponent of Arcade, and so thank you so much for joining me today. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, oh, I feel really loud, but um, <laughs> my name is Paul Barker. Um, I'm a product engineer with ArcGIS Online, so I work on Arcade. Uh, a little bit of everything, though, in practice, feature services, data management, offline, forms, pop-ups. So if uh, you have any of those questions, come find me at the island. I'm happy to answer them. So. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today we're going to just be covering um, a lot of the basics of Arcade, really why to use it, how to use it, but also uh, we'll go a little bit beyond that as well. So we'll touch on what it is, the benefits, the basics, where to find it in the web map. We'll go a little bit farther, do some intermediate and advanced stuff just to show you what's possible, get your brains thinking. Uh, and then we're going to end with some considerations, talk about what's next, uh, and end with some, some new re resources that are available on the documentations page. So what is Arcade? Let's see, on a show of hands, how many people in the room have used Arcade before? <laughs> what are you guys doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. No, uh, so uh, luckily, um, Many of you have heard of it before, but for those of you who may uh, are not as familiar with it, Arcade is a lightweight scripting language, uh, expression language, for working with your ArcGIS data. Uh, it works across the ArcGIS platform, which makes it a really powerful tool within not only your web maps, but also within JavaScript, within dashboards, uh, a lot of different places that you can use this and do customization. Uh, we'll be trying to show you as many examples as we can today. Uh, but really, wherever you use ArcGIS, you are probably, uh, you have access to Arcade, uh, whether that be ArcGIS Online, Pro, et cetera. We will be focusing on the online aspect of this today. Um, Arcade is portable in that it works across the platform. If you make a web map and use an Arcade expression, your downstream applications will be able to utilize those. And so again, it is, is usable everywhere. Um, it is secure, uh, AKA it does not compromise any security in your applications. Uh, it's also lightweight in that it's executed quickly. Um, I will, we will say um, the caveat is uh, Arcade is not a replacement for Python. It's not a, re a replacement for geoprocessing, uh, but it is a very powerful tool for doing on the fly calculations within your maps uh, and apps. And then this last one, geospatial. Um, by this we mean you can actually do geospatial calls like buffers, intersections, et cetera, uh, and which makes it a very powerful method for doing on the fly analysis without actually ever running any geoprocessing tools. So it can replace it in some cases, but not the really, really hefty ones. So we just have to throw that caveat out there. So Arcade is really useful, especially when you don't own a data set. How many times have you found a really neat data set and one of the attributes that's a numeric field is instead a text field? Oh no, now you can't map it, you can't do with it, do anything with it. Traditionally, you'd have to go back to the data owner, beg on your hands and knees, please go change the schema of your data. But with Arcade, you no longer have to do that. You have the ability to transform data on the fly within the browser, within the map. And it really makes it a more powerful tool for using data, um, especially when you don't own it. It also is very helpful when data is updated often. Uh, if you have data that's being updated behind the scenes, your map will stay up to date because every time you open that map, the arcade will execute on the fly upon opening. That way, if the data does change, the map will stay up to date. Um, it also just allows you to do extra customization, things that really you would have had to own the data before. You would have had to calculate a whole field, you know, do all this actual deep data processing. You don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and then these last two are just some examples. You can also just create very unique values built from different attributes, a combination of um, intersections, different, you know, combinations of things. Uh, really, I like to say, Arcade is magic and it lets you do a lot of really neat stuff. So if you ever talk to me about Arcade, it's magic. Um, <laughs> so um, this slide is a little bit of a repeat of what I've kind of already mentioned, but just to hone it in is that 
Uh, one of the benefits of Arcade is the fact that it does work across ArcGIS. So no matter where you are working within the platform, it does work downstream, which just gives us a big benefit of allowing things to work across uh, all of the different places that you work in your uh, different GIS workflows. Uh, some of the benefits of Arcade as well is just you can create stronger visualizations. We're GIS people. We want to create beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, and easy to understand maps. And Arcade really helps us do things like that. For, the, like for this example, on the left we see a bunch of decimal points and we would have just had to deal with it and that's just how it is. Whereas on the right we're able to combine numeric and text in order to create a well-rounded label that helps our reader just get straight to the point and better understand the data behind the map. So now I'm going to pass it on to Paul to keep talking about the benefits and where to find it. Sure. Um, yeah, like Lisa touched on earlier, um, you know, Arcade's finding its way into just about everything. Um, and so in the context of the web map, these are really the, the places that you can access and use Arcade. So you can drive your symbology uh, through it, transparency, rotation, labels, um, pop-up configuration uh, as well, and two different types of pop-up configuration that we'll touch on, as well as um, somewhat more recently, um, our smart forms. So you can drive business logic in your forms uh, to either dynamically hide and show uh, input boxes or automatically calculate values. Um, so really powerful in the context of data collection and enforcing integrity. And field calc is also another place where we, we expose Arcade and you can use Arcade to you know, burn in those values and make them part of your data set should you need to. And I guess worth noting, uh, some of you might have noticed that the, you know, while the new Arcade editor has, in, has made its way to just about every place in ArcGIS Online, field calc is lagging behind. We are working on that and hopefully by the user conference that will be, you will have a whole new field calc experience that will uh, bring in the, the new editor, but a lot of new functionality. Uh, totally on the side there, but uh, yeah, we're really focusing on field calc and uh, being able to give you better tools to explore the data and the results before you hit calculate and then it fails and then you're like, what went wrong? And then, so we're trying to make it a lot more interactive uh, to, to kind of help, help uh, both on the SQL side as well as the arcade side. And I think you will see a much more improved ability to write SQL expressions uh, for field calc as well. Um, that looks very similar to arcade with IntelliSense. Um, now, touch on a key concept uh, of Arcade. We talk a lot about profiles in the documentation, um, and when you first dive into Arcade, sorry, I got two mouses going on here. This way. There we go. Um, you might you might find uh, you know global profile variables and be like, what's a profile and what are what are these dollar dollar sign uh, dollar feature and things. So um, we want to talk talk a little bit about uh, profiles and what they are, and uh, I guess why they oops, why they exist. Gosh, this is brutal. I'm going, there we go. <laughs> um, so you can think of a profile as um, the, the execution environment of Arcade. So it's, it's self-contained uh, and it really determines what's available to you as a user to write an expression. So in this particular example, I've broken it down for labeling, which is one of the more simple profiles. Um, so we have what we call profile variables, and those are your dollar, dollar what's, uh, so to speak. You'll see dollar feature, dollar layer, um, dollar map, and that gives you access to inputs to feed into your arcade expression. And uh, the functions that you have available are uh, in, in a given profile are determined um, by bundles, and so we expose certain bundles uh, with a profile and give you access to functions. So not all functionality is available across all profiles, and most notably, um, where you see that difference is uh, around feature sets, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but feature sets um, just don't work in some profiles, uh, like labeling, we can't be like making asynchronous requests out to other layers, and then trying to label, it would, your map would just perform horrendously slow, same with symbology, so. And then um, part of the profile definition is the output. So what are valid return types? Um, in the context of labels, you can really only return a text. So anything that comes out of Arcade is going to get casted as a text. Uh, some support dictionaries, uh, like pop-up elements. So it determines what, what it expects as an output. And so um, we've just broken it down here. And uh, you can take a little look. But th this is just similar to uh, Lisa's screenshot there, where we're taking um, 
temperature and converting it from Fahrenheit to Celsius, which I agree with since I'm Canadian and I use the metric system. So, um, and, oh, I got it. So, thanks. I <laughs> I think you know the arcade editor uh, was a big update for the team, uh, and uh, it was really uh, allows you to hopefully write art expressions faster and more confidently. So um, the editor brings in all of the documentation that we have on our uh, developer site for arcade the language. Um, there are new ex uh, descriptions that tell you what those profile variables mean. Um, it's not shown in this uh, animation, but uh, in the context of the web map, we also make it easier for you to reuse expressions from another area. So maybe you um, defined your symbology using an arcade expression, and you'd like to use that in, the, in your labeling as well to give more context. So you can quickly copy that in and use that in the labeling. So, um, but one of the coolest things, uh, at least I think, is that uh, the arcade editor has full IntelliSense. So as you're typing, you're getting auto completion and that uh, everything you would expect from a modern IDE, uh, except maybe line by line debugging, which we do want to work on. Um, <laughs> so um, really nice. Uh, and if in the most recent update too, we are, I think, WCAG AA uh, color blindness compliance now. So uh, there was a big effort there to make it make it more accessible. Um, so yeah, a lot of work went into that over the past past little while and we're trying to replace every every spot uh, where, where it's currently being used. So um, oh it's bullets. Okay. So um, <laughs> Yeah, and talk about the kind of the anatomy of building your, your arcade expression. Um, you certainly have all of the things you would expect from a, from a scripting language. So you have access to you know, defining variables. Um, the, uh, you, just like you would expect to, you can do return statements. Some, it can be implicit. Um, I'm, I, like, I like things being very, very defined, so I always type out return, but you definitely don't have to. Um, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a rich set of functions, uh, you know, both for doing like flow control and logic statements. And uh, we have yeah, if else, uh, when, uh, the if, and for loops and stuff. So all that, all that stuff that you would expect to be able to iterate through and uh, and work with your data. And we'll talk. Just I promise we're almost to the demos. So, uh, <laughs> so we're gonna. Um, you know, so it is. You know, the, you can do all the basics, and I think that's one thing that the, you know we we try and stress in this session is that you know you don't have to write a lot of arcade to do something meaningful. It, um, maybe that's just combining two fields. Maybe it's averaging a, a, some data sets. Um, but there are uh, quite a quite a few ad, more advanced topics, and they I would say largely f center around feature sets in general. So feature sets are a way to uh, query a layer and get back a set of features and then do something with it. Um, so, you know, if you're doing your geometry functions, quite often you want to uh, click on a feature in the map and have that feature's geometry intersect with another layer and then get back all the features that it intersects. And then maybe you build a table or do something interesting. So, um, Lisa touched on this too. And, you know, we, we really put a lot of effort into giving, uh, giving you just about every geometry function out there uh, that we could think of. Except maybe reproject, which we do want to do. <laughs> um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, engineering work that has to be done for that to work well on the web. So that is something that uh, we know that you folks uh, continue to ask for, and we would love to deliver it. Uh, and it's in the works. It just it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, we support complex um, complex objects and data structures. Uh, we allow you to define your own functions, which is a really nice way to. Um, encapsulate business logic that you're using over and over again in, in longer expressions. And uh, you, know, you can fire off you know, regular queries to feature layers. Um, you can also start to do statistics. And, and uh, when you pair kind of group by and order by, you can do some really, uh, really neat things that would be really hard to do otherwise. Uh, so I'll, we'll show some examples of that. Uh, and I think we're at the demo stage. Yeah. I will kick it back to Lisa, and she'll show you some cool stuff. Oh, it would help if I. Uh... Stop doing the slideshow. So, aha! Can I have my mouse back? <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, we're gonna kind of step you through a handful of live examples of getting familiar with where do you find Arcade within the map viewer, as well as just start with the basics, work our way to intermediate and advanced, uh, and then Paul's gonna show us a lot of different other places within the map viewer that Arcade exists. And so from a very simplistic standpoint, um, I know that you mentioned, a lot of you mentioned that you already are familiar with Arcade, but we do say that not everyone has to be a coder to be successful with Arcade. So I'm gonna start with an example that kind of put, hits that home directly within our map. Bless you. <laughs> and we're gonna start with symbology. So here we just have uh, county population, and we may be interested in immediately a better understanding uh, where the at-risk populations are within our area. And this data set doesn't necessarily have the field that I want within it, and so we can just go ahead and calculate it. So the first place that we'll show where you can find Arcade is within symbology. And instead of just adding a field from our data, we're going to choose to add an expression. This will bring us to the Arcade editor, which has a little uh, example of uh, code within it. I like to get rid of it right away. And the first thing that I will say is when you're working with Arcade, don't leave this up here as new expression. This acts like a field name. You would never just call a, leave a field name blank because then you can't use and reuse it within the other places in your map. So make sure to name it something meaningful right off the bat. So this is gonna be a dependent population and this is actually also going to show up in our legend and the other places in our map. So it is really critical. I know it seems obvious, but please name your expressions. New expression doesn't mean anything to anyone. And so right off the bat, this is the Arcade Editor, and you'll notice that this toolbar on the right is collapsed. But if you want to see what's in there, you can expand it. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get started with the profile variables. Now, as Paul mentioned, uh, Symbology does not have as many profile variables as, say, a pop-up. And so in this case, you'll only see dollar sign $feature and dollar sign $view. Dollar sign $feature is going to let us access a feature within our map. And so this allows us to go in and explore the different attributes that are available within that feature. And in this case, I might be interested in seeing where the population 65 and older are, and I'm gonna add that with the population 18 and under in order to figure out that at-risk population. So I typed in 65 year, and it was able to look at the alias names and help me find that field quickly. Now, if you guys use the old editor, you remember that scrolling, scrolling, scrolling? Yay, we have search now, and it allows us to quickly find and easily click this to add it immediately to our expression. Now, if I hit run, it's going to give me an example value for that field, and I can uh, easily continue on knowing that this is what I expect, that the population 65 years and older for this particular test feature is 9,176. Now, with the IntelliSense that Paul was talking about, I can actually also just start typing dollar sign feature and still access those alias names. So if I typed in 18, suddenly we get that value as well, and I can simply add it in that way as well. So no, that's two different ways to add attributes, um, add, or sorry, add dollar sign feature values into your map. And now again, I can hit run and see the example value. This has now added these two together. Now this is the example where Paul was saying is you don't necessarily need to say to return a value in something as simple as this. Um, but you could as well, if I said, um, var dependent equals this value, and then I said return that value, it's gonna return the same thing. And so that's just the difference. You don't need to do it necessarily, but for more complex things, it is, uh, it is helpful. So that's just a very basic example of how to write an expression, and this is going to treat this like any other attribute in our data, and we can go ahead and map this and see where the different values are uh, within the map. Sorry, I wrote percentage and it was not a percentage, so ignore that part. Um, but this is just a very simplistic symbology example of using Arcade within the map. But now we're going to jump right into that intermediate use case within the pop-ups. Now, I can see some basic information about the population, but I may also want to add some context to my map. When we're talking about at-risk population, they might be impacted by something like the current wildfires in the United States. Now this is a layer from the Living Atlas that is bringing in where fires are right now. And so I may be interested in just understanding how many fires are existing within my county. 
And now this is the example of a feature set that we were talking about. Now we can see the at-risk population, but I also want to add that context. So now is when we do the exciting stuff, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> so within the pop-up, in the, instead of um, using a normal data attribute, we can add an expression and start to explore what is possible within the pop-up. Following my own example, I am going to name my expression, typing live is fun. And so now we are going to uh, really tap into using variables and defining uh, something within our map. So here, if we go to profile variables, you'll notice there's a lot more things that are in here. The pop-up allows you to really access a lot more things that are in here. Dollar sign feature is a single feature. Dollar sign layer is all of the values within, or all the features within that layer. Dollar sign map allows me to go see the other layers in my map. So the easiest way I like to add a feature set to my map, if, or to my expression if it's already within the map, is that I can just go find that layer in dollar sign map and add it. I didn't have to write any code, I just went and selected the, the feature set and returned it in here. So if I say return FS, which is my feature set, look at that, it is returning a feature set. So this is literally a set of features within my map. And now we actually want to do something with this, which is, uh, in this case, we're gonna go look at some of the functions that are in here. So again, uh, we were looking at profile variables, let's go into functions. And now I want to look at some of the geometry functions, specifically intersects. And if I wanna know what that means to do an intersect, there is, again, that built-in documentation directly within the interface, which uh, is a really nice addition to the new Arcade Editor in that it not only tells me how this function works, it lets me insert it directly into it, and it also will, can jump me directly to the documentation for that function. So it's a very integrated system, if you're get, especially if you're just getting started uh, uh, with Arcade. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and name a new variable int for intersex, and I'm gonna go ahead and just start typing intersex. And sure enough, here is that intersex function, and I can also see the documentation right here within the Arcade Editor. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this in, and I want to intersect my feature with that feature set. And if I want to see what that returns, Actually, in this case, it is an empty feature set, meaning this particular example doesn't have any intersecting fires in this county. And that may seem scary, but I promise that is still data, right? The value is zero. And so in this case, we may want to handle this particular feature set, but you cannot return a feature set in your pop-up. It will just say object. That's not useful, it's not giving us information, and so we wanna dissect this a little bit and we can use what's called the first function, which lets us access the first record in this row. And now we see it says null, which sure enough is still information. But now we're gonna go ahead and use one of the uh, conditional statements, which one of my favorites is the if statement, which you can see right here is if something, if some condition, do something, the true value. Otherwise, do the false value. So here I'm gonna use the if function, and if it is null, I want to return there are no fires here. Otherwise, I want to figure out the count. Look at that, I just typed count, and sure enough, I can see how many fires are within an area. So I could say, I could even combine this. There are, oh, let's see how good I can type live, you guys, you're really, See, we're testing my abilities, <laughs> fires in this area. And so now, if I were to run this, it's gonna say there are no fires here. So let's go ahead and go use this expression that we just wrote and use it just like we would use any other data attribute within our pop-up. So we can just go ahead and type the squiggly bracket. I like to just start typing exp. And there it is, our count of fires, because we were so good and we named our expression something useful. And so now, if I were to just use this, again, like any other um, value in our uh, table, okay, I wrote terrible logic here. There are one fires. 
This is where you can play with your conditional statements. Maybe use a when statement and handle if there's one fire, say there is one fire. If there's more, say there are multiple fires. This is, some, this is a perfect example of when you would then shift this to a when statement, which is essentially when you have multiple if statements. Uh, so this is just a basic example of combining these two data sets on the fly. This is using a geometry function, feature sets, and this is really allowing us to intersect data on the fly in ways that really were never possible before, before Arcade. But I'm gonna just end with one additional example where in your pop-up option, you also have this special option for an Arcade pop-up element. Now this is special because it allows you to combine both Arcade and HTML. And so one of the benefits of this is that you can combine multiple arcade expressions all into one so that you're making fewer calls. So this is great, especially when, say, you're making a call to a feature set over and over again. Instead of calling to it multiple times, call to it once, build your whole pop-up in one expression, and it could actually help the performance of your pop-up. So I'm going to follow my own rule. I'm going to name this, and in this example, we are using a function. This was something that Paul mentioned. I built this function called buildbox, which will allow me to put an image on the left and text on the right. And in just one line of a function, I'm able to reuse this over and over to build almost an infographic-like pop-up very easily with a combination of Arcade and HTML. And so in this example, uh, this example, this first chunk is that wildfire intersection that we just did, so you don't need to know that one because we already did it. But this one, we're also accessing housing unit information to figure out how many housing units might be impacted by a fire. And you'll notice this one is slightly different. This is a feature set by portal item. This allows us to access layers that are not even in our map. So this is actually going to spatially intersect this layer that lives over here in Living Atlas, and all I need is this item ID in order to access it, and it doesn't, again, does not need to be in my map. And I know, like, I'm over here like, ooh, ah. This is like really cool stuff. The fact that we are able to use that item ID, intersect this on the fly, and extract information from it, all using one simple line of code. And now, what this example will do it will intersect the information from both of those two different layers. Let's test our Wi-Fi as well today. Maybe. Let's click on a different feature. While we're waiting, <laughs> While we're waiting for Lisa, one, one thing to call it with feature set by portal item, um, it, does, it is a, a, a function that will not work as ex you might expect in disconnected scenarios. Mm. It, you, it, like if you go offline and take your map offline, it will not have that data offline to query. So that's something to keep in mind if you're uh, putting that in pop-ups or trying to use it to drive editing logic. So, no, Good note. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. And that gave it my pop-up time to load. Uh, and so you can see in this example, we have turned some of those basic things. Here's this first example that we wrote. There are two fires in this area. Yeah, that's useful, but look at this version of it. It's a lot easier to read. It has bolding. It has contextual information about how many acres there are. So we pulled multiple information in from that layer. And we can now see how many housing units are in the county that might be at risk by a fire. So this is all done with, I think that was like 15 lines of code, and we're able to then extract and visualize the data in more interesting ways than simply there are two fires in this area, right? So it gives us a lot more flexibility to work with HTML um, in order to really enhance our pop-ups. And so with that, I am going to hand it to Paul. We've now just touched on some basic to intermediate examples, and he's gonna show a few other places that um, Arcade lives within the web map. All right, thanks, Lisa. Okay, I've got a couple of examples. We'll see how much time uh, I can, or how fast I can squeeze them in. But uh, so uh, what we're looking at here is uh, a pretty, pretty basic map. We've got uh, some imaginary mineral occurrences, and uh, I've got the, some of the live uh, data from the Living Atlas around weather and. Uh, a few releases back, we added uh, a function called get environment, and that gives you, uh, as an expression writer, a little bit of extra context about the environment that uh, Arcade is executing in. So it, um, it could tell you about what the time zone of the map is. It could tell you um, what application is executing. So you could even you know, 
think about having an arcade expression and conditionally doing something different when it's opened in Map Viewer or say dashboard and things like that. So one of the cool things that uh, that we added rec recently is the ability to get the locale or of uh, the signed in user if they're signed in and if they're an anonymous user it will fall back to whatever the locale of the browser is. So um, this data set uh, is I would say structured pretty typically to uh, most data sets in Canada. Uh, the, there are both French and English attributes in this in this uh, in this example so or the data set. So typically what would you know happen uh, as a map author you'd create the English version, you create the French version and then tell people, like, if you want English, you go to the English one. If you want French, you go to the French one. Um, with Arcade, you can uh, start to think about merging all of that into a single map. So you'll notice when I click on uh, that pop-up right there, everything is in English. And if I just uh, switch over really quickly. Uh, to, oh, did I? Oh, no, it's just slow. Um, just quickly switch my... Uh, map viewer to French, and now come back and click on this, uh, you'll see my pop-up has actually switched to French. So that's using templated HTML, the attributes uh, from, the, from the feature layer that are in French uh, to build uh, a pop-up on the fly. And that is using the same kind of pattern that Lisa just showed with the arcade element. So if we come in here and uh, look at this, there's quite a, you know, it's you know, 20, 27 lines of code. Most of it is repeated, uh, just the repeating the HTML template. I could probably refactor this out and make it a little bit cleaner, but um, this, is, this is kind of the crux of it. I, we call the get environment function and we grab the locale and then what we're doing is a little bit of conditional checking. So we're saying, you know, if for some reason locale is missing uh, and undefined, then fall back to English. If it's French, then we build up our templated HTML uh, and inject the uh, French fields. And uh, in this case, you could you know, start to do else's or go into a when if you had to support even multiple languages. So very quickly, uh, you can create uh, bilingual apps. Uh, and there is a really good blog from the uh, Instant Apps team uh, on, the, on the blog site for ArcGIS Online that kind of walks through some, some examples like this. Um, and one more that I wanted to show too is uh, you can use the user info to change units. So if we look at this uh, data set right now, this is Yarmouth Airport in Nova Scotia. Um, and you'll notice that everything is in Imperial units. Um, that's actually because my account right now is set to Imperial. Um, and let's see here, let's go to my profile. Really quickly just change this. Uh, just for everybody's awareness, I would say 50% of the time I mess up this demo. Uh, so we'll see if, see if we get it right today. <laughs> so I'm gonna come over here and, and switch over to metric and my settings are updated, and let's go back. And just for ease of use, let's get rid of the French. So now, if I did this correctly, when I click here, you'll notice that everything's switched. So we've switched from you know feet to meters, uh, and. Uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius and kilometers per hour. This data set is particularly interesting because it has mixed units. Uh, some of the weather information is reported in metric and some is reported in imperial. And so to pull this off, we're using the same general idea. Uh, we're getting the locale and, uh, did, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong layer. Hang on, let me flip here to stations or there. So um, I've set a, I've kind of done some manual definitions here to about the to kind of define which fields are uh, in imperial and uh, in metric, and then what I'm doing is looking at the current user's uh, unit of measure, and then based on that, I'm dynamically building a field uh, list, which is another type of pop-up element, and doing some basic formatting. So the field list, uh, if I go down to the end here. Um, this is kind of the structure. Um, it takes a title and description like all pop-up elements. It is, it is of type fields and you, you pass it uh, a set of attributes to display as well as the, a list of fields you want to do. And if you're ever wondering kind of how, how to get started with these elements, we have over on the side here, 
Um, we have some templates, so if you wanted to build a field list and get a better understanding of how that works, you can quickly drop that code in um, and run it, throw it in your pop-up, and play around with those variables and understand how, how it all fits together. So that's, uh, that's a, so, some of the, I think, some of the newer and more interesting functions that we've added recently, and it really hits at making your pop-up quite dynamic. And uh, I'm gonna flip over to another example here uh, and talk about uh, just that spa you know, using spatial relationships of the map. So I've got some precincts here in gray as well as some crime. And you know, it's useful to look at this this way, but uh, quite often people want to summarize what they're looking at uh, with crime statistics. So if I was to click on the precinct right now, actually get a chart. And so this is going out and getting the, you know, the geometry of the precinct, intersecting it with the point layer, and then grouping by the type of crime, sorting it by the count, and then building up a chart dynamically using Arcade. So you can hover over it. And, um, you know, like to Lisa's point, uh, handling kind of those edge cases. So this is, uh, here's a precinct with no, no points in it. So we, instead of drawing a chart, we're just telling people that there's no crime. And so being able to uh, dynamically modulate that pop up on, on the fly based on your data really can create a much richer experience. And so this, um, you know, this is not a significant amount of code. This is, you know, this is the return statement. Um, but the business logic is really doing the intersect, uh, grouping by this field is not a particularly well-named field, but that is the crime category field. Um, and getting the count statistics, then using the order by function to sort that uh, so that it's you know highest to lowest, and then uh, really an if statement to handle the the no crime case. But the and then passing that information into the chart. Uh, very similar uh, pattern overall to the fields list, but uh, it allows you to really. Um, do some neat things, and so this is leveraging a spatial rela relationship uh, with uh, to to build a chart. Another way you could do that is if you had an attribute relationship. So you know what we would consider a relationship class. So this is a, a monitoring well, and I'm using Arcade to programmatically query the related records uh, based on the, you know, the the primary key of the well, and then draw historical groundwater measurements over time. And so this is actually an, an example where. You know, we, we, without the arcade elements, it would be very difficult to produce this chart uh, just through the user interface because, you know, each, the way that you define a chart, you could do some of the basic relationship statistics, but, you know, you couldn't easily handle the case where, you know, one feature had 10, 10 measurements, one feature had 200, and so, and definitely not sorting uh, by the date, so this really, allows you to do some pretty pretty powerful stuff. And um, once again, this is, not, uh, this is not a significant amount of code, and it follows a very similar pattern to the other one. The only difference is that instead of using the intersects query to get things started, we are using feature set by relationship name, which is a way to query, uh, simplify querying related records for, for a given feature. So, um, and I've got one more to show, I think, so. Last but not least, if you attended the plenary, you probably saw something like this, but we're gonna go into a little more detail and talk about how it works. Um, so this is, uh, anybody here uh, M, M enabled fans, M, M value fans? All right, this one's for you. <laughs> so, um, th with the latest release of ArcGIS Online, uh, we introduced a new profile variable called dollar user input, and that will give you access to where uh, the user has clicked on the map. So where that little little arrow is pointing in the pop-up, that will give you the X, Y location. And from that, you can use that to um, pass that into an ex another function that we'll go over in a second to get the closest M value at that particular click location. So you'll notice that uh, the mile marker field is the arcade expression here. And as I go along the road, that's dynamically changing. So um, not exclusive to just you know the only use case isn't, the only use case isn't just M's but it uh, it really shines in the in the M M use case, and I think one of the nice things about this expression if we go into it and look at our attribute expression here, um, you know you might not know how to write this expression, um, and I would say the good news is for this particular one you don't have to know. So if you go into uh, suggestions on a M-enabled linear or line layer, 
we actually have a template for you as well. So uh, you can just click it and insert it and then reference that in your pop-up and away you go. So we're, this is an area I, I think the team really wants to do a lot more of, of making it easier to do some common things that we see users doing. Um, so being able to just click and insert an expression, maybe change a few values to fit your needs. Um, and so we're still kind of figuring out the, way, the best way to do that for some of the more complicated cases like charts and stuff like that. But uh, I think you'll see a lot more a lot more templates and examples come in directly into the arcade editor over the next year is our, certainly our hope. Um, it's also a place to do to show, showcase, I would say, the best practices as well for some, some patterns um, so that you're querying things efficiently and uh, getting the absolute best performance out of it. And then, last but not least, we can look at the editing example. So uh, this is very similar to Anne's demo on the plenary. Uh, but as I digitize this line, I'm gonna You'll notice that the editing form, there's from M's and the two M's, those are auto-populated. Um, and what we're doing is using an arcade calculated expression to very quickly uh, find the, the M values. Oops, I'm on the wrong layer again. That gets me every time. <laughs> so if I go switch to the phone closures. If I go into forms, I was also using the, uh, the spatial relationship there too to uh, populate the, the road name. But um, the from and the 2M uh, have the exact same core business logic, so we won't look at both of them. But uh, let's edit this arcade expression really quick. So um, what I've done here is uh, we're looking, we're getting the roads, we're intersecting the road uh, with a small buffer just to make it a little more forgiving. And then we're getting access here to the intersected roads geometry and looking at the paths, which is kind of how the geometry is stored. And we're getting the first and the last vertex using some of our handy array functions, and then uh, using the point to coordinate function to, to find, uh, find the, the from and the 2M. And I've got a little bit of extra logic here uh, to uh, make sure that the first M is always the lowest number. So you can understand if it was digitized, depending on the direction it's digitizing, in the direction you digitize that road closure, um, you might go from high to low or low to high. So this flips that around and corrects it so that uh, the, from, the from is always the lowest number. So that's, I think, it for demos. I'm going to flip back over to some slides, I think. All right. Let's talk a little bit about considerations. I think one of the, one of the things that we've kind of seen from, from users is Arcade's a very uh, empowering like, uh, piece of technology once you get the hang of it. Um, you can definitely write some, just like any coding language, write some very poor performing Arcade expressions. And there's a lot to consider, especially with feature sets. There's, there's really no magic. Um, you know, if you're using feature sets and trying to iter iterate over you know, millions of features, it's going to be slow. Uh, we've got to query all that data, get, get it client side in, in many cases. So um, you know, there's certainly lots to consider. But I would say you know, one of the biggest things that you can do to start yourself off on the right foot is um, to really plan things out ahead of time. You know, Write it down. Uh, think about what you what you need to do in that business logic and get organized. Um, and we you know we talked a little bit about I think Lisa talked about you know being able to run and look at the output of the arcade editor and uh, leverage that to test small portions of your business logic as you build up to a complex expression. Um, you can use the return statement anywhere is like in your expression. So if you're looking at a variable and you're not sure what you know after manipulating it what the value is, you can either log that out to the console or just use return um, and and just look at it temporarily. Um, and definitely um, being able to you know define your own functions is a is a really big uh, benefit, uh, especially in complex expressions. And as you start to maintain those expressions over time. Um, having all of that business logic centralized in a single location in your arcade expression allows you to quickly update it, and it you know, minimizes just constant find and replace and errors and bugs. And uh, yeah, I just, yeah, feature sets definitely can be expensive. So, um, you know, if you're you know doing something where you're going out and querying like seven or eight other layers and intersecting and like it adds up, it all adds up. Um, so um, one of the things that you know certainly as developers, uh, you can open up the web console and look at the number of queries being requested and the response times of those queries. 
Um, and quite often, you know, I would say, you know, if you're doing similar things, they're going to have similar response times. But it'll give you a sense of the total response time. And particularly if, um, if you notice one layer is taking longer than another, that's where, you know, you can usually pretty quickly tell what the, which query that re relates to in, in the expression. Um, and you can kind of start to strategize about how do I make that query faster. In some cases, it might have nothing to do with Arcade. It could be disabling, um, you know, disabling editing on that layer so that we get, you get a better benefit of our caching system and so that um, you get the performance gains of all that CDN caching. Um, it could be maybe building an index. If you're querying a field and there's no index set on that field, you might define an index. So there's, there's some of those things that like have nothing to do with Arcade, but you may discover that through using Arcade, you might want to do something else. And we've got a session uh, Thursday, right before Dodgeball, I think, on managing large data sets uh, that will touch a little bit on some of these performance considerations as well. So, um, and, and just real quick on that, uh, one thing that I run into a lot as well is that when you're using a feature set, if you have the ability to use an attribute query, if there's good like point. a matching field between those two, like a FIPS code or or a GERS ID or something important. <laughs> it's this idea that um, you can use the filter function, which will utilize SQL query, which is going to be much faster than a spatial intersection, which is going to be a much heavier computational call. So if you are running into uh, slower calls, first thing to consider is, can I query this on a field instead of a spatial call? So one thing to consider when you're using feature sets as well. Yeah, definitely. It's a really good point. Attribute queries will almost always be faster. And, uh, and one of the things that you can do in feature sets too is be explicit about the fields that you're requesting. So by default, we'll request all the fields. Um, and uh, you can define, if you only need to work with one field, just only request that. It's less data to pull down from the server. It's going to be more performant. Um, and we didn't have a slide here, but I, I, I did want to touch a little bit about um, the function expects, and just talk a little bit about how Arcade executes. Um, so with Arcade, um, we only request the fields that we think you need uh, to run your expression. So we actually do some, uh, when, before the Arcade expression runs, we analyze the script, figure out what fields we need to query. There are definitely some cases where um, we can't auto-detect the field. So think about if you're like concatenating two strings together to get a field name. We can't automatically detect that. And there is a function called expects. And expects is a way of, for you as an expression writer to define um, fields that you need, uh, need to be queried to, for, your, for your expression to run that might not otherwise get detected. And so you can use some wildcards in that. Um, and that's really handy with some of the like, demographic data. Like if you're pulling in like, year over year, you could query all of those fields with that you know, base name and then star. And then you have access to all of those fields. So this is one that can, I, I think, trips a few people up. Uh, we've tried to find the right way to call that out in our documentation. But uh, I'm going to call it out here, too, just to be on the safe side. So if you find that you're running and testing your expression, and then you, uh, it looks all looks good in the editor, and then you, you know, click on the pop-up and, and nothing happens, I would say check to make sure that, uh, that you're not building you know, a field name programmatically or something like that, that you need to you know, better de you, uh, define through expects. And if you, nine times out of 10, that's, that's quite often one of, the, one of the first problems people hit that really causes them to scratch their head. So um, I think we're... Almost to questions. Uh, we've tried to leave a lot of times for people for questions. So in terms of what's next for the Arcade uh, team, uh, we are continuing to expand M value support. So some of the work we did in this release uh, just uh, last week really focused around discrete M interpolation. So being able to you know, click on the map and discover the closest M, uh, being able to work with a feature and say, at this distance, what is the M value? Or at this M value, what is the distance? Um, and so it's focused around that. We will uh, start expanding that, uh, that work into more feature set-like patterns. So being able to say, here's a set of you know, values or features. Uh, tell, me, tell me more about them. Um, we really, um, as, uh, as you folks as, as ex arcade expression writers have written more and more sophisticated ex arcade expressions across maps, uh, we really uh, are spending a lot of time discussing about how we make it easier for you to reuse Arcade. So um, 
being able to factor out that, you know, we talk about using functions inside of an expression. Um, you know, you might have a function that you want to use in 10 maps and not having to duplicate that and copy and paste it uh, each time into a new map is something we would like to solve. Um, still in the works, uh, it's going pretty slow, I would say, but uh, it's, it's definitely on the list. And like, um, I guess what we've seen, and I, if anybody has this requirement, I would love to talk to you and get some more information, um, but we've seen kind of a spectrum of, of people who would just like to make it easier to reuse it within the context of a map. Maybe your data's multi-scale, like the Living Atlas, like counties, states, they all have similar values and just being able to use the same expression across the map. And then some people are, are much broader and say, you know, like, I want to be able to use this in any map. So I'd love to hear your, your requirements uh, and, and help, help shape that, uh, that functionality. We, um, we have a, a project that's uh, you know, been in the works for a little while too, to really expand how we format date, time, and numbers, and giving you more flexibility to um, handle that, that formatting in a richer way, and also better support uh, you know, internationalization in your, in your maps and apps. Not everybody has to deal with that, but the people that do, it's quite painful right now, so we'd like to make that easier. Um, and uh, we are always trying to squeeze out as much performance and optimization as, as we can. Um, there are many of you that are pushing the boundaries of what we can realistically do, but we would like to extend those boundaries whenever possible. So um, that's a big focus for the team. And I, I would say consistency is another one that's not on this slide, but we, um, the Arcade team uh, obviously you know, works cross-platform in you know, the Maps SDKs, uh, online, enterprise, pro. Um, we do spend a lot of time making sure that even the edge cases return the same answer in Arcade so that you can write portable expressions that when you open it in, in Pro, it works great and you get what you expect and the same in the runtime and uh, in the web. And I think last, but not least, um, you know, the, where, to, where to get uh, some resources uh, and help. Uh, the developer site has all of the Arcade documentation. Uh, it went through a big update last year where we tried to incorporate as much feedback as, uh, as we could from, from you as users. So there is a, an entire resource section there now that pulls in um, videos from past conferences. It promotes the blogs. And I would say you know the, the blogs are some of the best places to go and find information. Uh, search for Arcade. Lisa's got a mountain of blogs that are useful. Uh, so, do, so do other members on the team. So uh, we really try and showcase, uh, you know, best practices there. And I would say, you know, for my demos, I think almost every demo that I've shown here today, you can probably find the map in a, in a blog. So if you search for my name, uh, then uh, you can probably find a live map and poke around at the code and and kind of take your time digesting and understanding it. So and. Please share your feedback. Uh, we do read it and appreciate it. So um, if you have something to share, uh, please take the time. Uh, or if there's something that you wanted to see here that you didn't see, please let us know too. We're always looking to kind of improve and incorporate some, some new content. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
Um, and if you have any recommendations, that'd be very grateful. Um, I don't, but uh, like the uh, on the at the showcase, um, Taylor McNeil is the person who did our our accessibility for the color blindness and things that um, she may have some some better advice than than myself. Um, so it'd be worth asking her really quickly. I think this. Um, question was, do, are there any plans to bring the arcade editor into Pro? Um, I think that's something that, that the Pro team is looking at how that might be possible. It is a, a web component, and I guess I should call that out too. If you as a developer want to use arcade in a really, like, a way that we don't already support, the arcade editor is available as a web component to download and use, and inside of the Maps SDK, you can execute custom arcade, so you, you know, Conceivably, you could, you know, we showed how to programmatically build HTML. You could use Arcade to programmatically generate a report uh, and do that in your own custom app, potentially. So that, um, but in terms of Pro, it's something they're looking at. I don't think there's any timeline. Um, Craig Williams at the Pro area would probably be the best person to ask about that. Um, yep, yep, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the question, question was, where is the expression name being stored and how is it being used? It really is being used, that particular expression, it's essentially almost like a stand-in field name. It's not actually calculating that value for every single thing as of a new field in your database, but it is executing on the fly. When you click on a feature, it will execute that expression. But when it comes to the expression name, that's what's going to show up throughout your map, essentially in place of a field name. So instead of it being called expression one, it's being called whatever your field name is. And so it really is just a placeholder to help you know what that expression is doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right here. You can pick. Um, the question was, can we can you use Arcade against views to manufacture a new field? I mean. I guess yeah. The, I guess the first part, views are no different than a feature layer. You definitely can do everything we showed today against a, host, uh, a hosted feature layer view. Um, in terms of the field, like the pattern today would be to create a field and then calculate the arcade value into that. You could do that um, if you needed it in the, the actual data set. So sometimes, like, you know, we showed the on-the-fly calculations. Those are great. Um, they w you know, if you went to export that data set through the item page, you wouldn't get that arcade expression value in it because it doesn't exist in the data. So field calc would be the way to kind of burn it in to your data set. So you gotta, you gotta build it to the source first. That's you, yeah, you would have to add the field to the source and then make that field visible in the view. And, and then if you calculate it through, it would work. It yeah, no, um, we are, I would say, this is experimenting with the idea that you might be able to define a virtual field based on an arcade expression, but that is definitely futures, and uh, there's a lot of performance considerations around that in terms of just overall you know, responsiveness, but it is something that we, we, we're looking at, whether or not we could deliver that in a way that didn't just be horribly slow. <laughs> Yeah, I, definitely. It, that 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 is one of the primary <laughs> primary ways that we're looking at, and um, we we do have some of that uh, like plumbing work underway. Um, but the I would say the most of the open questions are around what uh, you as need, users need to manage that. Like, you know, are you looking more like just a place to stash useful expressions? Do you want like something like a module type pattern where I can import? a set of functions into an arcade expression and then uh, the impact of that on the kind of broader system. I talked about feature set by portal item not working offline. It would be pretty complicated to manage all of this uh, in an offline scenario. So there's a lot of, lot of considerations, but yeah, definitely. Um, there's actually an item type quietly reserved behind the scenes. <laughs> so, um, Do 
That's a very good question. You can, uh, the question is, can I save my arcade expressions back to the layer item? And the answer is yes. Um, when you save your layer item, uh, you know, just like the pop-up and forms, all of that's carried through. I would say the small asterisk there is that if you are using expressions that take advantage of dollar map, they will not work against the layer because there's no map. Um, so just keep that in mind. So. Oh, I think this man has a gentleman in the back had his hand up. Well, um, question is offline. Can it read the MMP like the data from the MMPK or the <clears throat> vector tiles? Uh, we don't. The short answer is you can use Arcade uh, offline, um, but we. There's, we don't expose the ability to do anything with vector tiles. Um, you, could, sh you should be able to work with the data inside the MMPK, like the feature data. Um, but I personally haven't, like, I've never made an M MMPK. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, as long as it's a it, it, as long as it's a feature class or a feature layer, I think that should work and should just carry carry through. But uh, definitely not on the vector side. The the biggest thing I'd say to, with Arcade, um, other than the feature set by portal item two, to keep in mind is, if you were doing expressions that use feature sets from other layers, you have to keep in mind that those expressions are going to execute against the data you have offline, not necessarily the full data set. So if you're doing something where you know, you do an intersect, grab all the features, and, uh, you know, get the average or something like that. You may not have all the features offline, which would impact the, the accuracy of that result. So, um. <laughs> it's, it's a big team. <laughs> Um, question is, are there plans to make Arcade possible in Experience Builder? I, I would assume you mean authoring Arcade or using Arcade to drive some business logic. I think, I think that's a question you'd have to ask, ask the Experience Builder team directly. I'm not aware of any short-term plans for that, but it, it's come up in the past, but I don't know where that sits in their priorities and consideration. And if you bring it up, then they're more likely yep. to put it on their radar. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Um, you mentioned using uh, HTML in tandem with uh, Arcade for things like pop-ups. Yep. Um, and I've in the past used inline CSS for like extra customization. Mm -hmm. But it can often be like, if it's a lot of CSS, that's all, you know, it can be tough to read and tough to edit. Do you have any recommendations to like get around that? Or is that a feature that's like in the works? Or can, can it even be imported from somewhere else? Or is it really good question. It's about, you know, we do allow you to programmatically build uh, HTML. Uh, a big part of HTML is obviously CSS and styling. So um, we, in Arcade, we follow the same rules as the rest of the platform, and that we have a series of HTML that we allow, uh, that we say is safe and uh, has been vetted by our security team. And we don't currently support CSS definitions except inline CSS. And even some of that CSS is, uh, we, we, is, is a little more restrictive than I think we, we would like it to be. So we are relaxing some of the overall inline CSS rules. Um, but yeah, we, even, even Arcade uh, is not a, a way to circumvent uh, the, the HTML restrictions. Uh, everything gets sanitized before it's rendered in, say, the pop-up. But um, it's something we look at. Um, we will be adding, in the next release of ArcGIS Online, relaxing and adding in some new supported HTML across, not, it's not specific to Arcade, but as a platform. Um, so being able to, and some of that will include uh, more support for some CSS properties uh, that we don't pre currently support, like flex and line height and stuff like that. So if there's something specific you want, just definitely just, uh, I would say reach out. I mean, you can tell me, but I would reach out to support too and say, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Flex is on its way, so um, it, yeah. Um, but yeah, we are still bound by the overall security rules of the platform, and that doesn't include currently 
you know, CSS classes and things like that. And when it comes to working with HTML within an expression, and I know, it, yes, it can get unruly yeah. when all of a sudden you just have a bunch of HTML plus your expression, so it be, starts to become very uh, complicated and busy looking. Uh, what I'll essentially do is no, if I know which, which tags I'm using over and over, um, I'll assign them to small variable names and then just reuse those and concatenate, and it kind of helps clean up the expression a little bit. So at the yeah. very top, I'll just define some basic HTML that I'm going to reuse multiple times, and then I just keep reusing it as variables. Mm -hmm. So that's at least how to make some of the expressions a little less unruly. Awesome. Thank you very much. A great presentation, by the way. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Any final questions? We'll also hang out for a few minutes, so yeah. feel free to stick around. Awesome. Thank you, guys.